Hello, everyone. Welcome to Janice Fiamingo's live Q&A for ICMI 2021. Uh, the three of us have just been chilling back here waiting for this to start, but we are super excited to get to your questions. Now, the way this is going to work is that Vernon is going to be taking a look at the Whova interface for both her presentation and this live Q&A. So any questions that have been asked there, we're going to try to get to them. Now, if you try to ask any questions in the chat, we may not see them, so be sure to ask questions there. But the best way to get a question to Janice is to come into the live Q&A little screen here, and on the bottom, there's going to be a Q&A question. Now, I see 15 of you are already in here, so start posting your questions, and we won't be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try our hardest. But most importantly, We've showed Janice how to get back into this interface. So if there's any questions she has missed in Whova, she will try to answer them as best as she can. How are you doing today, Janice? Hey, I'm great. Wonderful to be here. And thank you so much, both of you, Chris and Vernon, for all of your work in making this possible. OK, so uh, Vernon, why don't you go ahead and start us off with a question from Whova? Yeah, sure. Uh, Sean Goldthorpe asks, men already suffer disproportionately from every leading cause of preventable early death. What's so special about COVID? Yeah, um, well, there isn't necessarily anything particularly special about COVID. The reason I decided to make that the focus of my presentation was because it seemed to me that it became an occasion, what I call the COVID phenomenon or the COVID project, which is separate from COVID-19 as an illness, became an, an occasion for increased uh, blaming, shaming, demonizing of men, and that that um, was worth looking at, and also became an occasion for governments around the world to uh, move to limit men's life possibilities even more than they have in the past. And, and what struck me most was the lockstep coordination between feminist ideology and COVID-19 messaging and policies. Okay, thank you for that. Um, question in Zoom from Douglas. Is there anything you think men should have done in the first year, say, given that men were being lied to, didn't men do the right thing in following government programs to curb what they were told was a deadly contagion? Wow, this is the, the big question, and I'm not judging men for not taking action. Uh, the whole problem with uh, state mandates is that they are enforced by the state often quite viciously. There were men, certainly in my home country of Canada, who attempted to keep their businesses open and they were punished. They received massive fines. Many of them went to jail. There were Christian pastors who tried to keep their churches open in defiance of government mandates. They were, went to jail. Uh, the, the mainstream media demonized them as threats to public health. Um, you know, so, so I, I, all I can hope is that men will join together with other men to research the truth for themselves and to be confirmed in making their own decisions about what is best for themselves and their families in community with other like-minded people. And, uh, and we'll find ways of um, engaging in resistance against state tyranny. Uh, it, you know, it was pretty clear, I think, from pretty early days in COVID-19 that we were being lied to. Government messaging was uh, on its face often um, irrational and self-contradictory. So, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not in any way attempting to criticize men for, for following orders, but uh, now nearly two years into this pandemic with really no, no let up in sight, I certainly hope that um, centers of resistance will continue to form. Carl Palmer asks, thank you for your presentation, Janice. I absolutely agree with you. Jacinda Ardern, our prime minister in New Zealand, uses those archetypes. 
Yeah. How best can those in the resistance against our devouring mother leaders encourage each other and fight this war in the midst of being misunderstood, mm -hmm. shamed, shunned, isolated from the very friends and families we love and are fighting for? Yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer, unfortunately. Um, it, you know, it is a very, very difficult time. This is, I, I, I see unprecedented division in society and within families themselves. The, and, and of course we are being, as I said in my presentation, one of the state initiatives has been deliberately to isolate us from, from each other, uh, to isolate us from other sources of meaning, spiritual nourishment, community sustenance, et cetera. So um, the best way to fight that I think is to reestablish those alternative sources of meaning and spiritual nourishment and community sustenance. But that's very difficult to do if you're facing a, a fine or a, even a prison term as is going on in Australia right now and elsewhere across the world. Um, you know, I, I, I just, it's, it's terrifying. I don't really have the answer, but I encourage everybody to, to uh, make common cause with, with like-minded people who do not want to be made entirely dependent on the state. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, all the attendees are asking questions. Thank you so much, because that's what makes all of this exciting. Our next question is from Ken Jovet. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. He told me one time and I completely forgot, but I look forward to his presentation this year. He says, to Janice, great presentation with hard truths. Where do you put the blame on the feminization of government and allowing governments become devouring mothers? Do you think any of this is related to women voting, being the majority voters and politicians chasing the female vote? Yes, of course I do. Um, it's no, um, it's not a hidden, hidden secret that the uh, introduction of female suffrage has led to an ever expanding state with an ever expanding mandate to control citizens in the name of security and providing and, and that has made possible exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, and it's clear that uh, in general, female voters have different agendas and different concerns than male voters and tend to vote for larger government, more controls over citizens' lives in the name of security. And even if that means sacrificing individual liberty, that's fine. And of course that's true for some male voters as well, but uh, it is uh, a factor in female voting and um, it's, yeah, it's uh, one of the big problems that we face and all we can do is present our alternatives and argue as best we can for why freedom matters and why it impacts both men and women very severely. And I think, uh, you know, our message is a stronger one. It is better to live free and to be able to make one's own decisions. Um, but we, we have to just keep on making that argument. I, I, I don't have uh, a, any easy fix for this. And this is something that has been in preparation for over 100 years. And if you go back, as I'm now doing, and looking at 19th century uh, pushes for changes to legislation, uh, changes to the whole narrative about the relationship between women and men, uh, primarily inaugurated in the first wave feminist movement, which we're told was the good movement, uh, you can see that the seeds of our present problems were clearly being planted then back in 1848 and later. And, uh, and we need to all know that and therefore to be aware of how very deep rooted the cultural attitudes and practices that we are fighting really are. This one's from Lysander Maybe. Thanks a lot, Janice. It's not really a question, more some news from France. The French pre president once said once, women are the first victims of COVID. The mm -hmm. violence they suffered increased. Uh, that women are missing school, don't have access to healthcare, what's, what's impossible in France, and so on and so forth. And at the end of this long list said, we forgot half the population here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I very clearly remember 
in, I mean, it is extraordinary to me. It, it's, it is absolutely extraordinary. I, I clearly remember in the early days when COVID was just hitting our shores here in North America, and we were, of course, all looking at what was going on in Europe, in France, and in Italy in particular, which was hardest hit at first. And, and somebody said, uh, well, a number of men said to me, maybe finally, you know, when we're battling this terrifying new virus, Maybe finally we can stop the discussions about male privilege and toxic masculinity and women bearing the burdens of emotional labor and all of those things. Maybe finally we can leave all that behind, forget about the gender war for a while, and just come together as human beings uh, to be concerned about protecting our communities. And it never happened. And I remember somebody joking. Um, oh, I, I, I'm forgetting... I'm forgetting his name. He, he wrote the book, uh, Stand By Your Manhood, Peter. Um, oh, I'm so sorry that I've, I'm blanking on his name. Anyway, he, he, I remember he tweeted out, how long before we see COVID-19 women hit hardest? And it was within a day that he tweeted that, that we started to get all the stories about the women who were forced to stay at home and look after their children because schools were closed and how women were more vulnerable economically and how women were taking on a larger burden of the house care and the caring. And, you know, it just, it, it, it started in lockstep, articles all across the Western world. And I, I realized then that our dreams that, if something serious happened, we would finally be able to leave behind the feminist narrative were for naught. It, in fact, it, it was the opposite. It became the occasion for even increased feminist narrativizing and increased male bashing. So yeah, I, it, it's just amazing to see. So questions are really piling up here. So I thank you, Janice, for uh, going through these as short as you are, but very poignant. Um, I want to tell a couple of people you've been posting um, regular messages in the Q&A and I've been deleting them. So if you want to post them in regular chat, please do that. Uh, the next question we have from Dean Hedges, who's the speaker this year. Hi, Dean. Have you had any difficulty finding gendered COVID fatality data? Oh, good question. Well, I know Dean is a, is a researcher extraordinaire himself. I haven't actually looked for um, the gendered COVID fatality data lately. Um, but in the early days, uh, I, did, I did look at it. it. It was quite apparent that men were dying in larger numbers. I think that num th those numbers have somewhat evened out, but, but men continue to face increased mortality. Um, there was even a discussion of the fact that, that male mortality would be even higher than female mortality from COVID-19 if it weren't for the fact that men tend to die earlier than women anyway. So there are fewer elderly men to be picked off by COVID than, than elderly women. There are many more women you know, in, in their 90s than there are men. So um, I do remember finding that data. It was even mentioned by um, Dr. Burks when, when she was the chief health authority for the United States in the early days that men were particularly vulnerable uh, and men tended to get more sick because of a genetic um, you know, vulnerability to, to these types of infections. Um, so it, it wasn't so much that that was being hidden. Uh, what was so shocking was that it was simply ignored as an issue. I never heard a single politician ever say that that was something, that that was horrifying you know, or tragic. I never heard a single one. We did hear a lot about racial differences and um, politicians and health authorities were quite quick to say it was tragic that racial minorities were particularly hard hit. And I think the data on that now has shown that it's actually not true, that, that deaths amongst racial groups are, are, are even. Um, but certainly the, the, the male mortality rate continues to be an issue that continues to be ignored. And, and that it, the, the indifference to male suffering and death just uh, still staggers me. We got another question from Sean Goldenthorpe. 
I wonder how we would be perceived as MRAs if we could be portrayed as working in an anti-government cause, which actually ends up threatening men's lives. Government is always going to be tyrannical. Perhaps it's a fact of life. Wisdom counsels us to accept. It is a fact of life, and it's also something that we should continue to resist because the ever-expanding state is bad news for men. And I do think that that is a part of um, a lot of MRA discussions and, and activism. Uh, and it maybe is a, um, a way to make common cause with others who don't identify themselves as uh, MRAs. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, that is, I mean, it's certainly one of my big concerns because it seems that whenever the government expands, it always expands in a feminist anti-male manner. So our next question comes from Eric Nelson. Thank you for the kind words mm, you Eric. contributed to the back cover of my book, The Judicial War on Men. Which Hi, Eric. I have, and yes, Janice, well, you can't really see the book because it's a green screen effect, but it's here, I promise you. Doing a little shilling for Eric there. <laughs> My question, what are two or three topics related to men that you would like to see written about? Because not enough has been written, has yet been written. On <laughs> two? Are you going to limit me to two um, or three? Uh, <laughs> that, uh, I'll get back to you about that, Eric. That's a great one. Um, well, everything. I mean, I would like to see far more discussion of men's extraordinarily important contributions to their societies, both now in the present and in the past. And I would particularly like to see, and it's a project that I have set for myself now um, with greater determination even and greater focus than I've had in the past, to, to examine men's contributions historically and the false narratives about men and about male tyranny and male brutality that were pervasive in even in the early 19th century as the women's movement developed in the 19th century all across the English speaking world and I'm sure all across at least the Western world too, but I'm not familiar with, with uh, other countries outside of the Anglosphere. Um, you know, we, we tend to believe falsely, I think, that up until the second wave feminist movement, the world was pretty much as feminists have told us it was, uh, a world of male privilege, male domination, and female suffering. And that narrative, I think, it has been challenged by some serious historians and MRAs, but it needs to be challenged much more. We've talked about the fact that the whole idea of the vote for women covers over the fact that many, many men didn't have the vote at the same time that suffragists were complaining about it. Uh, and that even some men who had the vote at that time had only had it for a very short period of time. There's a vanishingly small window between the time when most men had the vote and all women were able to get the vote. So, you know, that's just one element of the way in which our understanding of the past has been conditioned and distorted by feminist dishonesty that really needs to be uncovered, uh, if for no other reason that, that we have a greater sense of how we got to where we are and that we stop believing in this incredible myth of the reasonable feminist. Because if you look back to the origins of the feminist movement, it was always based on the idea of the moral superiority of women and the disposability and brutality of men. It both relied on male labor and discounted it. And the lies of that and the indifference to male suffering and male humanity need to be talked about far more than they are. That's my big subject actually right now. So that, that's something I'd really like to see addressed. Dan Sullivan asks, I don't think this was possible 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. What changes were most important to pave the way for getting us to act like sheep? Uh, yeah, that's the big question, Dan. Hi, Dan. Um, I, I, 
I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. Like, it's hard to say what would have happened 20 years ago uh, if uh, a similar um, media firestorm had been created around, you know, a, a new virus that that was threatening um, communities. But it does seem to me, and, and this is, I, you know, I'm just in, I'm just speculating, but it does seem that there is an increase in um, hysteria in general in society. And I can't help but feel that has something to do with, um, with the feminist narrative, with the whole social justice narrative, and also perhaps something to do with the fact that our lives have become increasingly, I mean, ironically, our lives have become increasingly secure. We all expect to live lives of reasonable safety and even comfort. And therefore any threat to those lives is not something we can take on board, but that that is magnified for us and produces in us, uh, you know, responses of deep fear and anxiety. Um, you know, some people have argued that there is much more uh, in the mass media and just generally in society, much more fear mongering about things that we can't really control, such as you know, climate change, environmental degradation. Um, you know all sorts of issues uh and and uh you know therefore illness fits into that narrative that we are under threat and we need to mobilize and we need to um we need to uh, outsource our security to government bodies but i i'm honestly i'm i'm not really sure uh except that and also i think um you know the last thing to say about that aside from the fact I'm not really sure, is that I, I think our um, lack of historical awareness and generally poor education system makes us all collectively more vulnerable to lies told to us by our governments and mainstream media, because we don't know very much about the past. We can't evaluate how, how people of the past responded to threats, the terrible things that people of the past endured. Uh, and therefore, uh, we aren't really able to evaluate the real conditions of our present. So I want to let everyone know that we're about halfway at the halfway point, and we still got about 20 minutes to go. So if you got some questions, feel free to ask them. Um, if not, I'm going to be forced to dance, and trust me, you do not want to <laughs> see that. So ask some questions. Next one comes from Mr. 0303. He says, Janice is a treasure. Well, she certainly is. <laughs> Could these restrictions be an attack on masculine way of thinking in general, as in security over freedom? Yeah. Also, yeah. the social distancing is preventing male cooperation, which mm -hmm. is one of the most powerful and constructive ways to achieve resist something. Yeah. Yeah, you, I think you pretty well summed up my my thought. Um, you know, and again, I want to say that I'm not an expert on you know the COVID nineteen phenomenon or the way governments responded to it or what we should have done in response to what they said and or anything like that. The only reason I wrote about this was because uh, you know it, it it has seemed such a pressing issue. Uh, it has dominated my thinking over the last year and a half, and I've been aware that yeah, you know, all the things that that um, men's issues advocates have talked about up until the the moment COVID hit are still pressing. I don't see them as any less important. Uh, you know, the the retrocious treatment of men in the family courts, the, the denial of parenting rights to fathers, male suicide at horrible proportions, uh, you know, just all of the injustices, the outright discrimination that is countenanced in the workplace, the ridiculous sexual harassment and sexual assault guidelines that are being brought in, the idea of affirmative consent, the, the uh, horrific shaming of men for their privilege and toxic masculinity in colleges. You know, all so many issues, they're all still going on and they're all still pressing, but you know, it just did seem to me that COVID ramped it all up and, and uh, exactly as you say, really became an attack on male ways of being in an even more fundamental way than anything feminism had devised quite up until that moment. Um, you know, it, it, yeah, the, it, it 
it, it, it did seem that it was an attack on men in every aspect of their lives. And of course it harmed women too, but men particularly as I tried to show. So that's why I decided to focus on it. And to me, it revealed, the COVID phenomenon revealed the direction that feminist led governments are planning to go in the future, which is to continue the demonization of everything that men do and everything that men, you know, every way that is masculine that men have of responding to their societies and contributing to their societies. And I expect that we're going to, even when COVID is a thing of the past, which I hope it will be, but may not be for many years, uh, I, I think it, that we're going to see that continue into the future. So we need to be prepared for it. Here in CS, hey, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, what's up? Which, which turn is it? Was it? It's, it's mine, I think. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Kieran C. asks, thank you for your excellent presentation, Janice. Do you think there is something special or unique about the feminine or its history in the Commonwealth countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand that mm -hmm. exacerbates the effects you noted? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I would need to have more of a in-depth comparative understanding about how women in uh, you know the the non-anglo sphere whether in the west or in other countries have um, you know mobilized for their rights uh, or have told stories about the position of women to really be able to say actually what I the little that I do know about uh, the feminist movement in a country like Italy, for example, which I've read about somewhat, Spain, um, a little bit in France. I don't know that there's anything particularly unique, except that it seems that the feminist narrative was able to take hold in the Anglosphere more completely than in these other countries. That's my impression. I don't think it has been fundamentally different in its blanket accusations against male tyranny, uh, in its positing of women as the sole guardians of um, moral virtue, you know, even while women were trying to throw off the shackles of, of uh, that moral virtue. I think the narrative is pretty similar. For, for whatever reason, in the Anglosphere, it has had far greater success in shaming men and convincing men to take a step back uh, and you know to apologize, to be humiliated, to be humbled, and to feel wrong-footed, you know, uh, to allow feminists and women in general to, to make men feel wrong-footed uh, and, and to give up on the, the virtues of masculinity and uh, the, uh, any pride in being masculine. For whatever reason, um, feminism has been more successful in the Anglosphere. Okay, now it's my turn. So Douglas asks, the men's movement often rails against men's gender disposability and deaths mm -hmm. in all areas of life, yeah. other than yeah. maternity. You seem to be supporting something I believe in, that freedom is more important than life. Is that a stance? And if so, does the men's movement need to stop worrying so much about men's death? No, I, well, that's a good question. Very good question. And maybe I I'll come back to you and and uh, and talk to you about that in in uh, wherever you've put your question because uh, it's a huge one. I guess um, you know I would echo something that libertarian Tom Woods said about COVID nineteen, which was that we allowed COVID-19 to make us believe and to act in ways to, to confirm that it's more important to stop living than to, it, it, it was necessary, I don't, I don't even gonna be able to say it, that it's okay to stop living in order not to die. You know, that that's what, the, that was the COVID-19 still is really mentality. We'll, we'll, we're all willing to stop living in order not to die. And um, it's not that death is unimportant, obviously, or that male deaths aren't, aren't crucially important and I, they should be talked about. But I do believe that 
unless we have our freedoms, our life isn't worth living. And I do think that is a masculine value. I don't think that it's a feminine value. I think the feminine value is of security and life security as the highest value. And, and therefore that it's a very difficult fight. I think when we're facing a pandemic where some people are dying to make the argument that it's more important for people to be able to live fully. Now I would feel differently, I think, if this were a virus that was killing 10% of the population, you know, or, or, you know, this was a bubonic plague or something. Obviously then that would be a different kind of emergency. And, and what is so striking is that people have acted as if it were that, when in fact, if you look at the case fatality figures, it isn't that at all. It is unfortunately a virus that is very risky for people who already have serious underlying health problems. And it's a virus that impacts those who are very, very elderly and frail. And as the great Barrington Declaration made clear, those people need to be protected. We need to, to take necessary measures in order to isolate them from the effects of the virus. But the rest of us should have been able to go on with our lives. And I do think that living with risk is part of what it means to be human. And we need to be able to evaluate how high that risk is and have open discussions about what the best way to mitigate the risk is while still maintaining our freedom to live. Uh, so, so no, I don't think that men should stop talking about male deaths because uh, you know I don't see that it's, it's um, a, a one or the other kind of situation, but I do believe we should assert that freedom is a very high value and it's a higher value than security at all costs. Ken Murray asks, hi Janice, fantastic talk. Rosa Coyer and others have highlighted how UN Agenda 2030 mm -hmm. is about control of economy, ecology and equity and thus the currency resources and thought. Your talk ties a couple of these threads together very well. Is Agenda 2030 something you have found to be specifically anti-male? Well, I think all government agendas for exerting greater control over the citizenry, any agenda that has to do with creating a stronger technocracy in which we are led by experts who make decisions about all aspects of our lives, any agenda that has to do with biosecurity that will be controlled by a governing elite that make decisions about the great unwashed and prevent us from making our own decisions. All of those, I think, end up being anti-masculine, certainly. Um, you know, they may not necessarily, well, I mean, depends on how you see the relationship between maleness and masculinity. Uh, there will be roles for men in those societies, certainly, but they will be roles in which men cannot determine the conditions of their own lives or the conditions of their own families. And uh, because that makes men a lot more controllable. Men, dissident men, uh, rebel men are always the greatest concern of governments that want to control their citizens. So in that sense, yes, I think the COVID project is part of this kind of project to control dissident men. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes to go and I'm going to start picking out people who haven't had a question asked just yet. Hopefully we can get back to the rest of you. Janice, just give one word responses so we can get through these questions. <laughs> one word? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so the next question comes from Blair Daly, who's also going to be talking uh, for this conference. Cool that you talked with Dave Rubin. He's a huge voice now in conservative, freedom-loving media. Have you stayed in touch with him? Are there... Are there more media figures with big audience who are now reaching out to you and your fellow very effective MRA spokespeople? I haven't kept in touch with, with uh, Dave Rubin, unfortunately. And no, I have to say that nobody is reaching out to me really. Um, uh, although I'm, I'm sort of in, in distant touch with, with occasionally with Jordan Peterson and I may have the opportunity to, to uh, produce a course 
um, at his university, but uh, I'm well. I'm pretty small potatoes, I would say overall. I don't. Uh, I'm not in close touch with, with you know major figures who are promoting freedom, um, but I'm glad to see that uh, that Dave has become uh, a a figure who speaks out against um, the ever expanding grasp of government control, and it's really encouraging to see people from various walks of life. Uh, coming on board that project. Terence White asks, I have a theory that governments attempting to extend, extend themselves can get buy-in from female voters by framing mm -hmm. issues in a feminist framework. Yeah. Could the political gynocentrism be strategic levering, levering of feminine in-group preferencing? Uh, well, yeah, it certainly seems as if it does that, um, you know, politicians from all uh, across the political spectrum, including conservatives and even libertarians, I think, are very, very sympathetic to gynocentric narratives and use them to uh, promote their their point of view. Uh, I, I uh, yeah, I guess the question is whether um, that's a, a, a strategy that MRAs should use as well because women are harmed ultimately when men are harmed. And so do we need to emphasize that more when we talk about harms to men? I tend to resist that, um, it makes me bristle when we have to talk about how this harms women, but I know that uh, that tends to be a strategy that, that has legs. So maybe we need to consider it. Yeah, our next question comes from Steve Moxon, also a writer. Oh, hi, Steve. Wrote, yeah. Great to hear great from you. Great book. I've met him once, sort of. Isn't the panic, isn't the panic over the lurgy just as with climate apocalypse nonsense? The apothesis of the left backlash against the workers for giving the left egg on their face in showing Marxist theory doesn't work by not rising up as market Marx predicted mm -hmm. and prescribed the origin of identity politics. From hating the worker, the white male, is now hatred of humanity in favor of non-human nature. Mm -hmm. oh, I have to agree with that, yes. Um, what what um, collectivist movements in general, and they're all, I guess, communists in some way in origin, although they took very different forms in the 20th century, uh, influenced by cultural Marxism, of course. I guess what they all have in common is, is the hatred of the individual, uh, and that often is the individual worker who takes pride in his work and who expresses himself through his work in ideal conditions anyway, um, and that person is always a danger to the, the collectivist mind. Uh, so yeah, all of these movements now have um, uh, particularly anti-male, but also, as you say, anti-human, um, anti-freedom, but yes, anti-human impetus. The, the entire uh, climate emergency movement uh, expresses its hatred for humanity quite openly. And you know, over the last 10 years, there have been many books published sort of celebrating the idea of the death of, of human beings. And wouldn't it be wonderful when the planet could flourish on its own without us parasites? Uh, and yeah, that, uh, that is pretty startling to see the nakedness of the hatred of, of the human and, and the preference for uh, something else, a, a transhuman entity. Tim Murray gives us another one. Hi, Janice. Brilliant talk. Uh, Catherine Austin Fitz talks about Mr. Global as the guiding hand behind the COVID agenda to pave the way for central bank uh, digital currencies, uh, central bank digital currencies. Do you agree? And if so, who do you think these people are? Hmm. Uh, Tim, now you're getting into those, uh, <laughs> those regions that... Uh, I'm afraid to even enter. I mean, I just don't know. I read recently uh, an argument um, by somebody saying that the notion that somebody is in control of all of this, you know, that there's an overarching agenda controlled by a group of oligarchs is, is false. You know, that, that this is uh, the result of a multifaceted movement 
in which even those who appear to be controlling it are themselves merely expressions of the you know, particular cultural moment. Uh, you know, he was absolutely against the idea that anybody, any one body or group of people is in control of this. And I just don't know. I don't know. And I don't know what the end game is, really. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand it. Uh, and I'm afraid to venture there. All I see is that we are moving in a direction where, in general, individual human beings have less and less control over the circumstances of their lives. And, and that that is terrifying. But, you know, beyond that, I, I really am afraid to go. I, I just I don't have enough knowledge. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Um, I thank you to all of the attendees. We managed to answer 18 questions. So that is fantastic. Uh, we're about to have Warren Farrell come up next. So be sure to get your questions ready for that. Uh, thank you so much, Janice, for coming out for this. I'm always super excited to talk to you. Uh, you had some really great points that you made today. Uh, what are some ways that people can um, find your stuff? Well, I'm back on Twitter after a, a lengthy hiatus. And so you can find me on Twitter just under Janice Fiamingo. Um, my producer Steve Brule and I are starting up our videos again. We're gonna that's gonna mainly focus on the false uh, mythologies of first wave and early second wave feminism. Uh, and uh, so you can find us at Studio B. But if you go to my Twitter page, um, I don't think I have it there yet, but I will put up the um, uh, URL for, for uh, our new Studio B, which we've just launched on YouTube. So that's the main way. Okay, and if your question didn't get asked, um, be sure to put it onto the Whova live Q and A mm -hmm. for Janice Mingo. Yeah, I look Janice forward to answering them. Best. Yeah, she's going to go there and try to answer any questions, or if there are any other questions that you didn't, you just now think up, go ahead and put them there. She'll be more than happy to answer them. Definitely. It was great to talk to you, Janice. Thanks a lot, Vernon. You All too, right. Um, have a good day, uh, Janice, and we will see everyone in about 20 minutes for Warren Farrell. Bye-bye.